Jack and everybody, thanks for, for having me. I, uh, I'll take over the slides from here. Thanks for calling in one hour before crucial moment in our nation's history, I guess, and <laughs> the debate. So um, uh, I want to talk to you about today about a topic that, that's maybe a little bit different from, from what we've been talking about in the past. I, I haven't called into all of your, your webinars, but uh, I want to talk about benign tumors of the spine, which I, which I think is a really exciting topic because for the most part, you know, these patients end up having a great out, outcome. Uh, they have very, very significant neurological problems when they come in. And the MRI scans and the films look sometimes really bad, but for the most part, you can really achieve great outcomes in these patients, which, which may, makes it a very satisfying disease to take care of. I, I want to thank uh, the fellows who called in, my colleagues who uh, shared some of the slides and cases. And uh, I want to go straight into uh, my presentation. If, uh, if we consider benign tumors of the spine, there are really only five or six pathologies for the most part that, uh, that are relevant. Obviously, nerve sheath tumors, those are primarily neurofibromas or schwannomas. Then tumors that derive from uh, the coverings of the brain or the spinal cord, uh, meningiomas. Then myxopapillary ependymomas, primarily in the lumbar spine that we see very frequently. And then, um, maybe less frequently paragangliomas. We're not going to talk a lot about those, but I want to give you a little bit of a history and uh, basic understanding and knowledge about some of the most common benign tumors, and then we'll, we'll show you cases. Uh, these tumors make up only about 2 to 4% of all primary CNS tumors. Uh, they're much less common than cranial tumors or brain tumors. And most of these are low-grade tumors, which again makes it really satisfying to take care of these patients because for the most part, these patients do very well. Now, classif classification is, is, is very straightforward. It's really based on, on the anatomical location. You have intradural tumors on the left side. You have intradural extra or intramedullary tumors on the left side. And you have intradural extramedullary tumors in the middle. And then you have extra dural tumors here on the right side. And, and the reason why the classification is really based on the anatomical location is because most of these tumors uh, should be, or at some point will be resected surgically. And it just makes much more sense to therefore classify them based on their anatomical region rather than necessarily their histology. The clinical presentation is frequently with pain, either radicular pain or just uh, uh, low back or neck pain. Uh, the, the radicular pain you'll see is uh, explained by the fact that a lot of these tumors compress or are very closely related to uh, nerve roots, uh, or they can present significant neurological uh, fun dysfunction such as myelopathy because they can uh, cause spinal cord compression in the cervical or in the thoracic spine. Uh, so motor deficits are relatively frequent and then sensory deficit about 39% of cases, but the vast majority really present with pain related sy uh, uh, symptoms. Um, probably among the most common tumors are schwannomas. About 50% of intradural extramedullary tumors are made up of schwannomas, uh, primarily in the cervical spine, but also lumbar. They arise from the sensory uh, nerve roots in the spine, therefore, uh, again, related to pain-related uh, uh, symptoms. They can displace neurological elements, therefore they can cause neurological deficits, of course, but they present primarily with radicular pain. Again, most of these tumors are low-grade. Uh, very typically, as you can see here, the dumb shell shaped configuration of these tumors they can grow into the spinal canal and outside the spinal canal, and typically will, that will then, over time, as they grow relatively slowly, will displace the bone, and they can uh, lead to a very typical bony erosion. So if you get a CT scan, you can see that these tumors slowly erode and configure uh, or, or change the bony anatomy in that region, which can help you with the diagnosis, of course, and which may also be relevant in terms of the surgical treatment of these. Now, uh, very rarely do these become malignant. There's an entity called the uh, um, melanotic schwannoma, which is, uh, has pigments inside. And there's a higher chance of those tumors uh, to uh, uh, become malignant. But for the most part, these are really 
uh, low-grade uh, benign lesions and local control with surgery 90 to 100 percent. And uh, if they become symptomatic, then the treatment is really surgical. If they are small and asymptomatic, we will very frequently follow these patients with serial MRI scans. Somebody comes to the office, they're relatively asymptomatic, we may say we'll just get another MRI scan in six months. And if, if it looks like they're actually growing, that would be then an indication to remove those surgically. And I, I put in a few uh, papers, relatively recent papers that describe some of the management uh, related to these tumors. This is a, a paper that was published recently, 90 cases of spinal schwannomas. As you can see here, for the most part with surgical resection, you can get a gross total resection. But you can also see that 27% in this series actually had post-operative complications, either sensory or motor related complications, but most of these really resolved within one year. So for the most part, these patients do really well. And then obviously use a microscope, use microsurgical technique, use intraoperative monitoring for all of these lesions, which has been shown to be beneficial. Then somewhat related, uh, uh, neurofibroma, also related to the nerve roots, uh, but uh, in contrast to the schwannoma, which really displaced the nerve root, the neurofibroma really grows around the nerve root. So the nerves actually go through the neur neurofibroma, and therefore it can be much harder to resect those lesions. And therefore also sometimes the neurological side effects of surgery are more significant. Uh, they're associated with uh, NF1 or NF2, uh, von Recklinghausen disease, and uh, there's a, a, a chance of these also um, uh, becoming malignant. There's about a 10% change, 10% chance of developing uh, malignant peripheral nerve sheath tumors, especially with NF1. Uh, so that, that, this, that also makes them distinctly separate from schwannomas. Um, but other than radiographically, they're, they're sometimes very, very similar. Uh, they also, if they, if they, if they present uh, syndromically, then obviously there can be multiple neurofibromas. This is a plexiform neurofibroma in a pathology specimen. This is intradural. You can see there are multiple neurofibromas that, that uh, can show up in the uh, neuroaxis. And if these lesions become bigger and, and uh, cause neurological compromise, we will make a decision sometimes to remove these. Uh, or remove the ones that are the bigger ones to decompress the spinal cord, for example. But there's obviously no cure because you, can, you cannot really uh, resect all of these lesions. Uh, and surgical management can be more complex because they are so closely related to nerve roots. There's a higher risk of neurological deficits with surgery, especially if they, uh, if they are associated with malignancy, such as MPNST, so malignant peripheral nerve sheath tumors tumors have a higher chance of neurological deficits after surgery. Again, that surgery is always being done with uh, microsurgery and with intraoperative monitoring. Meningomas, fairly benign lesions, frequently, uh, as you can see here, dural-based, anterior or lateral to the spinal cord, uh, frequently can present with neurological deficits such as myelopathy, occurs more frequently in the thoracic spine, but also cervical. But once diagnosed and if treated surgically adequately, again, these patients overall do really, really well. And again, the, 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 the treatment is surgical. If they get bigger, if they cause neurological deficits, if they are small, if patient is asymptomatic, we will watch these and uh, get serial imaging over the subsequent uh, time period. This is a series of 131 surgically treated meningiomas about 10 years ago primarily female patients. Again, the location is more anterior and more lateral. And uh, overall, these patients did really well. Uh, and uh, and uh, there are neurological deficits that can occur after surgery, but a lot of these are really temporary. And finally, myxopapillary ependymoma is very, very frequent in the lumbar spine. The most common spinal tumor within the cauda equina can present with back pain, can also present with multiple radicular uh, symptoms because they are so close, closely related, obviously, to nerve roots. A low-grade tumor, overall, very, very good prognosis. There's a, um, uh, if they occur in children, they can metastasize and they can be more uh, serious. But in adults, the ones that we see are usually have an excellent prognosis once removed uh, surgically. Now, 
uh, what is the surgical uh, treatment, and, and especially for the, 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 uh, the tumors that we see, and, and we'll show you a bunch of more complex cases, but uh, what, what I wanted to talk about before the fellows present you some more complex cases, I want to talk to about some of the minimal invasive treatment, surgical minimal, minimal invasive treatment options, which they are available, especially in the lumbar spine. And uh, we, all, we talked about MIS obviously before. The idea is to minimize iatrogenic injury to the muscle, the, the tendons, to minimize iatrogenic instability from a large laminectomy. And uh, especially in the lumbar spine for these lesions, I think these are really great candidates for minimal invasive surgery. Uh, and uh, again, the idea is to get these patients in and out of the hospital faster. But especially with tumors, of course, it's always the paramount, the most important goal is to make sure that you have a good outcome and you, you don't cause any problems. And therefore, I think the uh, overall, the threshold to really do this minimal invasive is much higher than in patients who have degenerative spinal disease. But in the lumbar spine, I think it is, it is really feasible for most of the uh, intradural extramedullary lesions and also extradural lesions that we see in the lumbar spine. And I'll show you two examples. Again, the rationale here is, of course, to you know, avoid complications related to open uh, surgery. I like to use navigation, uh, and uh, I've tried to incorporate navigation into tubular surgery over the years. And again, especially for tumors, I think it, it comes in really handy. It eliminates fluoroscopy. You don't have to wear lead. And once you're used to the workflow with navigation, it really makes it very, very efficient and, uh, and faster than it would be with fluoroscopy. Now, the idea is, again, so you remove these tumors through a tubular retractor, like on the right side, without having to do a big laminectomy. It's lower infection risk, less pain, and so forth. But it has some, some, some challenges, technical challenges, especially when it comes to opening and then closing the dura uh, without complications. Now, uh, minimal invasive spinal surgery has been described for uh, some of these spinal tumors in the past. This is a paper by Praveen and Dean Chow uh, from about 10 years ago where they described a series of patients who underwent mini open de uh, decompression and tumor resection. And these are primary, I think they had one case that was actually an intradural intramedullary tumor, uh, which is quite challenging, obviously, to treat MIS. And I'm not sure that that's really... Uh, that's safe, and I, I would not do that. But for extramedullary tumors, especially in the lumbar spine, they also saw very encouraging results. Encouraging, and so far as there was less blood loss and shorter hospitalization in these patients. So that's really reflective of a lot of the other things that we've seen with MIS. So should you cut down on the um, on the hospitalization length, and these patients go go back to work earlier with less pain. Uh, these are some papers that were published recently, and these are again all. And primarily in the lumbar spine, intradural extramedullary spine tumors treated with less invasive surgery. Also cost analysis here. So I think it is certainly feasible. And uh, in my, my uh, experience, it's certainly preferable to treat a lot of these tumors with MIS if you're comfortable with MIS techniques. This is an example of a patient that had a spinal uh, uh, ependymoma. And uh, you can see here on the... Um, you can see here on the MRI scan, uh, it's located in the uh, mid lumbar spine. It's intradural, extramedullary, typical uh, presentation of a mixopapillary ependymoma. And uh, in the old days, we would have done an open laminectomy, opened the dura, and found, you know, find the tumor resected. Nowadays, we do this with navigation. We uh, place the uh, patient in prone position. We get an intraoperative CT scan and merge that in the operating room with a preoperative MRI scan. And then we start using navigation uh, already for the skin incision. So you can plan your skin incision. Uh, we use tubular retractors for most of the degenerative lumbar spine, uh, 18 millimeter for lumbar laminectomy, 21 for MIS T lift. And for these tumors, I use the, the largest fixed uh, diameter tube is 24 or 26 millimeters. And those are the ones that I usually use for the tumors. So 24, 26 millimeter tubular retractors. You can certainly use expandable retractors as well. So we, uh, we identify the perfect trajectory for the tumor, place the tubular retractor. And, uh, and then uh, this is a uh, video that shows the uh, initial muscle uh, removal under the 
through the microscope. Uh, this is a 24 or 26 millimeter tubular retractor. We start drilling just as we would for lumbar spinal stenosis. Now we're going contralateral. We're undercutting the spinous process, uh, then uh, removing the contralateral uh, lam uh, lamina. And now we open the dura and uh, tack up the dura with tack up sutures. And you obviously have a very, very small window and that's where the navigation comes in handy because you know exactly where the tumor is. That's, that's the nerve root, that's the proximal nerve root going into the tumor here. You dissect that off, you stimulate the nerve root that goes into the tumor, you stimulate the nerve root that comes out of the tumor, and then either piecemeal or if the tumor comes out in one piece, you can uh, uh, nicely uh, remove it. And then the a little bit of a challenge is the dural closure but we've got specific uh, instruments that we use to really facilitate that. And we get a watertight dural closure. We'll test it in the operating room. And, um, and, and these patients stay, you know, keep them on bed rest overnight. They get up the next day and then go home. Uh, uh, and then we get an MRI scan a few months later. And that's just the uh, using a, a dura, dura seal here of fibrin glue to cover the dura and then watertight closure, of course. Now, um, this, uh, and I'll show you second case, and then we'll have the fellow present some cases, but I'm happy to take questions, of course. Now, this is also a lumbar case. Again, these lumbar tumors really, uh, they really, uh, they're great for MIS. Uh, this is a, a extra foraminal lumbar schwannoma. You can see that here. You can obviously treat this from the front, from the side, from the back. The question is, how much of the facet joint do you have to remove in order to really get this tumor out? And would this patient need a, a fusion? I, I felt that in this case, this was an extra foraminal tumor. It was not really associated with the dura. And I felt that if we come in with a tubular retractor from the side at, at a specific angle, we'd be able to find the tumor and then resect it without having to really sacrifice the facet joint and therefore save that patient a fusion. And uh, this is the MRI with, uh, with contrast and uh, a coronal view showing you very nicely how that tumor kind of comes off the nerve root there. And uh, so that, this is what we did. We, we uh, positioned the patient. I tape these patients down a lot because I want to eliminate all the soft tissue movement that I think that increases the accuracy of the navigation. Then we get a uh, intraoperative CT scan and you get a low dose intraoperative CT scan. You can adjust the radiation dose. You merge it again with the preoperative MRI scan and then you can use navigation to plan your skin incision. And that's what we're doing here. So we want to get in here at that perfect trajectory to kind of bypass the facet joint, but get into uh, the, uh, you know, get, get good access to that lesion. And that's what we're doing here. We're planning the incision, play, placing the tubular retractor. Now this is now looking through the tubular retractor on the surface of the tumor. We remove the lateral aspect of the facet joint and this is now the navigation showing us that we're right on top of the tumor. And then you try, you know, again, you use a bigger size uh, tubular retractor, find the uh, margins of the tumor. You stimulate everything, make sure that there's no nerve root on the surface. And then we cut into the tumor and piecemeal we, uh, we, uh, um, remove uh, the, the lesion. And in this case, we were able to resect the whole thing. And uh, that's the post-operative MRI scan. And the patient did uh, really well. And, uh, and went home the next day or two days later. And that's, uh, that's, uh, those are the two cases I wanted to show you. Uh, are there any questions, comments? Um, yeah, hi, Scott Blumenthal here. Yes, hi. So in, in what's really remarkable, you know, when we do, you know, small incision or MIS, just regular spine decompression cases and have a dural tear that needs sewing, Sometimes we have to, to really resect a lot of bone to get the instruments in. You must have special tools to sew the dura through the tube, and that could be helpful for the rest of us that, sure. you know, unfortunately would have occasional incidental durotomies through smaller incisions so that we don't have to expand the incision too much. Yeah, so that's, that's a good point. I use, uh, uh, those are originally designed, I guess, for endoscopic surgery, uh, but they are easily converted to tubular or even open surgery. Uh, it's, they're, they're, I, don't, I don't think I'm making a mistake by naming them. They're Scanlon, it's, a, it's called a Scanlon uh, endoscopic uh, dural repair set. Actually, Rick Fessler, actually, uh, I, you know, Rick 
uh, told me about these many years ago and I got those and uh, they work really, really well. Other surgeons just use uh, uh, just uh, just regular like uh, Casa Viejo needle holders, but they, but they're just, you know, they're, they're not really good through a small tube. Yeah, that, that was very slick, Roger, watching do that repair. Yeah, it took, it, took, it took me a lot of CSF leaks to get to that point where I'm comfortable <laughs> closing the, the dura, but, uh, but it's really, and, and then also it's the needle, you know, we have a fish hook needle. So the needle is one that one of our attendings here introduced me to many years ago when I was a resident. It's a tiny little needle and it's really, it really looks like a fish hook. And uh, it's a Neuralon suture with a fish hook needle. I can, I can send you the, um, the specification. And that really, it helps you because you can really hook the dura through, through a very, very, you don't, you don't, you have a tiny little access point, you hook the dura on both sides and then you have a knot pusher and, and, and push down the knot. Yeah, that would be great. I'd, I'd love to try to get a hold of those uh, Scanlon instruments and uh, yeah. see your little hook suture. Okay, I'll, I'll send you the uh, specification. I, I just don't uh, remember now the name of the suture, but I, we, no, obviously I have that written down. So uh, I think uh, next we will have um, uh, we'll have uh, Jake, I think, right? Yep. So Jake is one of our uh, senior residents in neurosurgery at, at Wild Cornell. He's going to talk to us. He's going to present a case, and then um, and then we have Lynn McGrath, who uh, is coming after that. He's going to show a few cases as well. Okay. Thanks, Dr. Arnold. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Jake. So this next case is uh, an interesting case. It's a giant ventral cervical schwannoma. The patient is a 35-year-old male who presented with progressive neck pain and upper, um, upper back pain, who was developing a right upper extremity radiculopathy, but was otherwise neurologically intact with no uh, other past medical history. Um, on exam, the patient was intact, had no myelopathy. Um, his neck disability index, NDI 26, um, consistent with neck pain that's causing you know, significant interference with daily life. He came to us um, for evaluation after having already obtained an MRI, C-spine with and without contrast. Uh, we additionally obtained a neck CT angiogram. Uh, so on this MRI uh, of the cervical spine, um, we're looking at the sagittal and axial T1 post-contrast images which demonstrate an intradural extramedullary solid cystic enhancing mass that's ventral to the spinal cord spanning C6 and C7. Uh, the mass posteriorly displaces the spinal cord and causes significant cord compression at these levels. On the next slide we have, um, let's see, the T2 MRI. This again reinforces the cystic nature um, of this mass on the axial scan, you can see um, there's high-grade cord compression here with no CSF posterior to the cord. Um, importantly, there's no T2 signal change in the cord, which would indicate um, you know, cord edema. So putting these findings together, um, let's see, I don't think I'm controlling that here. Putting these findings together, um, you know, the patient is diagnosed with a giant schwannoma. Um, giant schwannomas span two or more vertebral levels or extend uh, greater than two and a half centimeters outside the neuroforamen. In this case, we obtained a CT angiogram, which was unremarkable. However, uh, it's not uncommon for these lesions to show bony remodeling um, or scalloping of the posterior aspect of the vertebral bodies. If the clinical exam or history raises concern for a syndromic cause of the schwannoma, particularly NF1 or 2, uh, these patients should be further screened with complete neuroaxis imaging as multiple coincident intradural meningioma, schwannomas, neurofibromas can be seen and might require um, attention. So some pre-op considerations. Um, you know, surgery is indicated in this case for the symptomatic uh, spinal cord compression due to the low cervical ventrally positioned giant schwannoma. Um, surgery ideally will achieve the goals of obtaining tissue for diagnosis as well as decompression of the spinal cord and stabilization. In this case, 
we used several operative adjuncts. We used interoperative monitoring as well as an interoperative uh, CT for 3D navigation. Uh, we performed the anterior corpectomy, uh, then tumor resection, cage reconstruction, and then um, stage two, which was the posterior paraminotomies and C5 to T1 fusion. At the end of the case, uh, lumbar drain was placed to help with uh, healing and prevent CSF leak. Uh, so here we see the patient uh, positioned supine with rigid three-point head fixation and our radiolucent Mayfield head holder. Um, the endotracheal tube is taped up and away from the operative field. Uh, note also the reference frame is rigidly affixed to the Mayfield head holder. On to some uh, operative pictures. Um, in box A, you can see uh, the discectomy is being performed. We perform the disc discectomy above, below, and between the surgical levels of interest here. In picture B, um, we're performing the corpectomy using a high-speed drill. A large portion of bone we try to leave in the middle and uh, remove in one piece uh, to be used later as autographs. Um, in panel C, you can see the PLL is being elevated with a nerve hook and carefully resected with kerosene rondure, um, obviously being careful to avoid unintentional durotomy. And then in box D, you can see we're sizing the expandable uh, cage, which we then remove and, and place at a later point in the procedure. Um, so here are some more pictures of the tumor being resected. Um, box A shows our midline durotomy. We did we use a uh, 11 blade here. Um, in box B, the dura has been tacked up with four uh, tack up sutures and the um, Schwannoma was actually covered in a thin layer of arachnoid, which was easily lysed with a nerve hook, allowing the tumor to sort of extrude towards us. Box C illustrates um, the fact that this is a pretty cystic tumor and it was easily uh, decompressed with the nerve hook. D illustrates um, the tumor is completely removed. You can here see the anterior spinal artery and it appears patent well perfused. Box E shows uh, ventral and dorsal nerve roots, which are carefully inspected uh, to make sure that we're not leaving behind residual tumor at this site. And then box F shows the start of the cranial portion of the watertight drill closure uh, using proline suture. Once this drill closure is completed, uh, we usually cover that in you know, uh, drill sealant and test the drill closure with a Valsalva maneuver. Um, at this point, the cage is placed. We also placed an anterior plate um, to prevent anterior migration of the, of the cage. At this point, um, we started the second stage of the procedure. Um, this is performed to decrease the risk of adjacent segment disease and pseudoarthrosis. So uh, we flip the patient prone. Um, note here in the in picture B, the spinous process clamp is affixed to T1 and oriented caudally away from the operative field. Uh, we then performed bilateral C5 to T1 foraminotomies and C5 to T1 posterior fusion. Picture C and D just demonstrate the intraoperative CT navigation um, used for the cervical lateral mass and the thoracic pedicle screw placement. And uh, postoperative films here, the MRIs in A and B uh, demonstrate gross total resection. There's no enhancing tumor present there, and there's a good cord decompression. And then C and D are the AP and lateral x-rays, which demonstrate intact hardware. Uh, so we have an operative video. Most of it we've already clicked through here. Um, so I just wanted to highlight one aspect, which was the dural opening and the releasing of the arachnoid covering of the tumor. So. Here we have the midline durotomy. There's a wood sin used to, to guide the 11 blade and tack up sutures placed to retract the dura away and, and maintain the visual, visualization. And here you can see the tumor is a pretty matted down, kind of held down by this arachnoid layer, which is easily freed with a nerve hook. And once that's done, the tumor extrudes out towards the surgeon. Um, so a few intraoperative details, the case was nine hours, estimated blood loss 500 cc's, and intraoperative monitoring was stable throughout the procedure. Um, here's the specifics of the implants that we used. 
So this patient's post-operative course was unremarkable. Um, he stayed in the hospital five days. We did we placed a lumbar drain at the end of the case and used that for two days post-operatively. We clamped it for a day and monitored the patient. Um, on post-op day four, there were no signs of leak, so we DC'd the lumbar drain and DC'd the patient. Where he went home with the cervical collar, went on to bed. On follow-up exam, uh, patient was intact, no radicular pain, was ambulating independently. Um, in this patient's case, as with most schwannomas, um, the lesion was found to be WHO grade one, uh, curable with resection alone without need for post-operative chemo and radiation. Um, higher grades with atypical features would warrant referral to an oncologist for evaluation for radiation and systemic treatment. Um, so any questions that I can answer, or Dr. Pearl can answer. Very slick. Yeah, I mean, that tumor coming out from the front. This is Jens Chapman. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yes, Jens. Hello. Jens, we hear you. Jens, unmute. This is Jens. Can, can you hear me now? Yes. Yes. Sorry, I have my loudspeaker problems. So this is absolutely beautifully shown and done. These are my two questions. So first of all, uh, you implied that you don't get a full neural axis MRI scan sometimes. I may have misunderstood you. Could you just please clarify when you'd get a full neural axis MRI scan and perhaps also address the question of a CT myelogram uh, in dubious cases of intra versus extra medullary. Thank you. Jake, so, you want to? Yeah. yeah um, we wouldn't routinely get full neuroaxis imaging unless there were signs consistent with uh, syndromic cause of this giant schwannoma, which he didn't have. He's otherwise unremarkable past medical history. Um, in terms of the uh, CT myelogram, I haven't seen us, I haven't seen that done. Do you have any comments on that, Dr. Hartle? Yeah, I mean, it, it may be helpful if you're really not sure if it's extradural or intradural. In this case, you know, we, review, we, we reviewed the MRI scans very carefully and it, it, it looked really, it was intradural. So, uh, but, but sometimes we will get, if we're not sure, we will, get, uh, we, we, we will get myelograms at times for sure. In this particular case, we didn't. So then question number two is a beautiful resection for a schwannoma like this, a very gratifying uh, resection that you showed. If this goes towards the nerve roots, how aggressive do you try to be and use intraoperative uh, motor or root stimulation to try to differentiate harmful from sacrificable tissue? Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. That's a good question. In this particular case, as you could, you could see from the video, it's just kind of popped out and then the whole thing came out in one piece, which made it really gratifying. And then you could see also that there were nerve roots that, we, that, that were visible that we inspected to make sure and there are situations where we will stimulate, if, if, if it looks like the tumor is stuck to a nerve, we will certainly stimulate. And if there's a question whether or not we, have, we would have to sacrifice a nerve to remove tumor, we will usually leave tumor behind, you know? In this particular case, it was not an issue, but it is an issue and, 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 and uh, Lynn has a case actually in the cervical spine posteriorly where we used a lot of monitoring to really identify the motor and the sensory component because we want to make sure that we protect the motor route. In this particular case, that was not an issue though because it was just totally separate. Roger, one quick question. I understand posteriorly doing the uh, fusion to back up your anterior construct, although you, you had uh, a pretty hefty hardware anteriorly, but why the decompressions? Why the foraminotomies when you had decompressed the roots uh, ventrally? Yeah, that's a good point. I, I don't think we did a foraminotomy. I'm not, I'm not Jake. I, I was I was waiting for that question. Uh, I don't think that we did a foraminotomy because there was no real reason. I think we just put in screws. Okay, the orthopedists are all agree. <laughs> <laughs> Even though I'm surprised as an orthopedic surgeon that you would be uh, against a, a <laughs> against more surgery, but that's <laughs> very nice. <laughs> Hey, listen, Roger, taking the tumor out would be plenty for us. We don't want to get in any more trouble. <laughs> I think we'll move on with, uh, with Lynn. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Hartle.
So Lynn, Lynn is, our, is, is uh, one of our fellows, uh, clinical fellows, and he, uh, he joined us from uh, Seattle, where he trained with uh, Hofstetter and with uh, some of the other guys at the university there. And, uh, and uh, thanks for putting those cases together, Lynn. My pleasure. Thanks, everyone, for having me. I'm going to start with two very similar cases that we treated a little bit differently and kind of focus a little bit on what led to the decision to treat them differently. The first one is a 40-year-old male who presented with six months of non-radicular pain in the right lateral neck, two months of progressive numbness in the right arm and hand, and new progressive numbness in the right proximal leg. He had no contributory past medical history uh, and a largely benign uh, neurological exam. He had some non-dermatomal uh, decrease in sensation to pinprick and light touch. On uh, imaging, we can see a large contrast enhancing, well-circumscribed mass, uh, center of the right C2, C3 junction. There is a significant expansion of the right neural foramen and displacement of the thecal sac, <coughs> thecal sac to the left with erosion of the C2 lamina. You can see it again here on the CT. Um, you can see the articular surface has been completely destroyed uh, at the C2-3 level on the right. I'm just gonna go back one more time to highlight something and uh, that is the vertebral artery in this case looks on a couple of slices like it could be encased by the tumor. So not just displaced, but actually also encased. And so that uh, resulted in us doing an angiogram. Uh, which showed some feeders from the vertebral artery into the tumor, as well as a little bit of um, stenosis or narrowing of the vessel itself. And because of the fact that on the MR, it looked like the uh, tumor was potentially encapsulating the tumor, we did a balloon test occlusion, which the patient passed. And so we decided that the safest thing in this case was just to take the artery endovascularly so that we didn't have to worry about it at the time of surgery. On the surgery itself, here we see uh, prepping for a, a posterior uh, approach. You can also see here uh, that we placed up front the hardware uh, contralateral to uh, the tumor to stabilize that unstable joint during the resection itself. We use total navigation, so we use navigation for uh, screw placement as well as um, localization, incision planning, uh, and to judge the resection of the tumor itself. In this case, we uh, placed uh, screws from one to four on the left-hand side um, and uh, in one and four because there's just no um, appropriate bony anatomy to place screws in C2 and C3 on the side of the tumor. There's so much bony destruction. The next case and a related case is a 30-year-old female who presented to us with left arm pain. Um, Again, no contributory past medical history. Uh, motor exam was normal in terms of strength, but she did have abnormal Hoffman's, Babinski, and Clonus uh, to the left hemi body. In this case, you can see on the x ray there, really impressive bony erosion of the C2 3 joint on the left hand side. And again, we have a C2 3, this time left sided. <clears throat> mass very consistent with the schwannoma. Again, expanding the neural frame and causing lots of bony destruction. Um, and in this case, what I'm trying to highlight with this picture here is the nice plane that we see between the tumor and the vertebral artery, unlike in the last case. And so, uh, we still did an angiogram on this patient uh, because we wanted to make sure that if we did see the vert, if we did have to take it, that we knew exactly what her functional outcome was likely to be. 
uh, she again passed a balloon test occlusion. But in this case, because of the fact that it seemed like on the MR pre-op that there was a nice plane between the tumor and the vert, we opted not to take, not to sack the vessel uh, preoperatively. We just went into surgery with the knowledge that if we needed to, we'd likely be able to get away with taking the artery since um, the contralateral vert seemed to perfuse both sides of her posterior circulation. Um, again, uh, very similar workflow. We have total navigation. We use it for incision planning, localization, screw placement, and confirmation of our uh, tumor resection. This is just an intro video of our uh, hardware placement. Um, and again, in this uh, instance, placed an almost identical construct, just uh, on the opposite side. Had no uh, bony anatomy to put screws in on the side of the tumor. We had to fuse from one to four because of the fact that the C23 joint was just totally unstable and there's no good place to uh, place hardware in the side of the tumor. Um, and uh, I think the teaching point uh, with these two cases is that just uh, paying attention to some of the details, some of these minute differences on the MR can really change your whole approach to the case ending up uh, embolizing the vertebral artery in the first case and not in the second case and having our suspicions confirmed in the second case it was uh, very clearly separate and not adherent to the vertebral artery. We were able to take the tumor out without um, disrupting it and the patient's doing really well postoperatively. The second case uh, I'm presenting and it, it really illustrates nicely one of Dr. Chapman's um, points and I'll get into that in a second. This is a 26 year old male who presented with a severe right scapular pain, actually so severe he went to the ER multiple times. He was concerned he was having an MI. Uh, pain was worse with lying down, neck extension. He eventually got some relief with steroids, um, but not much. He had really no uh, contributory past medical history, really healthy young guy, uh, an athlete. Um, but he did have some slight weakness in his right biceps and his right wrist extensors, no upper motor neuron signs, no other concerning parts of his exam. So on, uh, I'm gonna go back to that MR. On his um, MR imaging, if I can get it to play here for us, we see a dumbbell shaped uh, lesion in the right C5-6 neural foramen. Again, expanding uh, the bony anatomy here. See if we can play the CT just to emphasize that point. Doesn't seem to want to work, but um, in this case, again, we did a uh, angiogram. Um, patient passed a balloon test occlusion. Um, in this case, there was not that much concern that the artery was in close proximity to the tumor. So we didn't um, really consider doing a preoperative embolization. Uh, we wanted to know uh, more uh, what our uh, ability to take the artery intraoperatively was going to be. Um, so again, we use navigation for uh, screw placement, for uh, localization. In this particular case, we're able to fuse a preoperative CT with a uh, preoperative MRI with the intraoperative CT. So we can actually use the fused MR to visualize the soft tissue anatomy of the tumor a little bit more nicely. And that really helps um, minimize our bony resection and uh, maximize uh, our trajectory under the tumor. This is an intraop photo that really nicely demonstrates um, the tumor uh, resection cavity. You can see here, there's a little bit of an indentation in the thecal sac. Right here, we can see the sensory uh, nerve root that was where the tumor originated from. We tied it off and sacrificed it, took it with the tumor. And then you can see the motor root here, also kind of uh, depressed anteriorly. And this was the real learning point for me in this case, just how closely um, intertwined the motor and the sensory nerve roots can be, even in a tumor originating from a sensory root the um, 
meticulous dissection that you sometimes need to do to make sure that you're preserving the motor root, especially in cases where it's adhered. Um, and in reviewing this, I noted that in virtually every case series, there are some schwannomas that are reported to have arisen from the motor uh, nerve root. In fact, there's one case series that was done from prior to uh, widespread use of intraoperative monitoring, where the surgeons resected the nerve root that the tumor originated from in every single case. Regardless of whether it was a motor or a sensory nerve root, they took every nerve root and they found that in retrospect, 3% of their patients had total um, loss of motor in the relevant myotome. And so uh, what that tells me is that in 3% of cases, likely you're going to have the schwannoma arising from the motor root. And so intraoperative monitoring and interrogating uh, the neural structures is really key to making sure that you don't have uh, a potentially devastating outcome postoperative. In this case, uh, we did do uh, extensive intraoperative neuromonitoring because of how um, closely related the two structures were, and we were able to uh, get the tumor out and preserve the motor root, and the patient had a resolution of his uh, slight biceps and wrist extensor weakness postoperatively. But that was really uh, an eye-opener for me and um, really nailed the point home as to the utility of intraoperative monitoring in these cases. Um, again, we placed screws. We did uh, uh, lateral mass screws and uh, pedicle screws uh, bilaterally at uh, C7. And uh, as I mentioned, the patient ended up doing very well postoperatively with uh, resolution of the symptoms. Any questions about uh, any three of the cases that I presented, I'd be happy to take. I think we're all pretty speechless about all the cases that uh, you guys presented. That was uh, uh, wonderful. Excellent uh, summary and, and great surgical technique. Well, thanks very much for having us. Yeah, it's a pleasure. Hey, Roger, I do have one question. Yeah. So, uh, you know, most of us on the panel here are trained orthopods. So how many cases does it take before you become proficient in resecting these tumors? And granted, you guys have training in the brain, but is it 50, 100 cases, 200 cases? Yeah, it's really difficult because I, you know, I did as a resident so many brain cases, you know. I, I, I mean, I would say probably 50, you know, I, I really don't, it's hard to tell. It's really more, you know, being able to navigate under the microscope and using microsurgical instruments, you know. Um, I don't know how long that, I mean, I would say maybe 50 cases or so. I, um, you, you definitely gotta be, I mean, the one thing that I'm always, what, what, what Lynn mentioned is the, 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 the value of the monitoring. In that particular case, we just did that a few weeks ago. I had never seen Really the utility of monitoring so clearly like in that case, because you could see that motor nerve root really coming out just proximal to where the tumor was. And uh, it was just a millimeter away and, and that nerve root kept on stimulating, which was good. But it was really, it was amazing to see how close that is. So, so if, and, and, and there are situations, if you, let's say you don't use the microscope or you're not really as meticulous, it would be so easy to just sack, you know, injure that motor nerve root. So, that, 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 that was a really great case. And, and Roger, one last question. How has your techniques changed from, say, compared to 20 years ago? Is it because of all the great internal fixation we have and that made a big difference? Your techniques, obviously, on the resection probably haven't changed that much, but I'd like to hear your comment. No, it's really more for, you know, but what really has changed is, is like, the, like, like what I showed initially were like those tubular cases in the lumbar spine. That, that has for me really been the biggest change that you can treat some of these lesions that before we had to make like a huge, we had to make huge incisions. Now, if you're, com if you're comfortable, uh, you know, operating through the tube and you know how to open and close the dura, then those become actually really straight, straightforward. <clears throat> what I don't see, what I do not really see happening is minimum invasive for, for some of these cervical tumors that, that we just showed. I mean, I, you know, we're teaching a course in Salzburg every year and you have surgeons from all over the place present cases. And I, 
I was like, they were presenting a case where they do percutaneous C1, C2 screws with navigation in a trauma situation. And I saw that, that was earlier today. Uh, it was a course that's currently happening in Salzburg and the surgeon was showing percutaneous navigated screws in C1, C2 and advertising it as like very straightforward. I mean, that, that, that's something I, I would, I have a very, very hard time really convincing myself that it is safe. So in the, but at the end of the day, I mean, safety first, you know, if you can do it in the lumbar spine, it's, it's very straightforward, but in the cervical spine, I think it's not something that I, I think is ready for prime time. Great. I see in the uh, chat, there's a question in these large cervical resections with total navigation, where do you place the reference array? And I think uh, Dr. Hartle's workflow, and correct me if I'm wrong, is that if it's upper cervical, we'll place the reference array actually on the uh, Mayfield uh, pin fixation device and uh, just clamp it rigidly there. If it's uh, lower cervical um, and we want the reference array closer to where the actual uh, surgical site is going to be, we place a spinous process clamp uh, lower down within the actual um, uh, surgical field. Yeah, that, that, that is correct. There's another question about biopsy. Usually these, no, the goal is usually total resection. So there's no need really to get a biopsy on, you know, there's special situations where we may want to get a biopsy for, but for none of these cases that I showed really we would seriously consider a biopsy because again, the, the goal is to totally resect these. Roger, let me thank you again for uh, assembling this and giving, doing such a great job. Um, I guess we're all gonna go get a, a political education in just a little while so uh, we can make this a little less, uh, earlier. <laughs> And just let me put a plug in, if anyone's interested, Saturday uh, is a motion preservation course given through the Seattle Science Foundation. It's free to uh, uh, people who want to uh, observe. Uh, and it'll include some cadaver dissections as well as lectures. So uh, everybody's welcome. But thank you again, Roger and team at uh, Cornell. It's thank you, wonderful guys. to see you. Thanks yeah, great having... cases. Thank All you. Right. Have a good night. All right, take, take care, care, everyone. Good night. Good night. Bye-bye. Thank you.